I should say that. Okay. Um, most of what I will say uh, will concern we descend as a whole, um, but all the recitations that I do tonight from we descend are going to come from volume two, which is the new. Uh, it's not yet published. So. <coughs> Uh, the man, who's, the character, who speaks the prologue of this presentation um, calls himself the last one. And he kept a journal in the immediate aftermath of a cataclysm that wiped out or drove off everyone else <coughs> except for a five-year-old boy who cannot or will not speak. This fragment is one of the most ancient texts in We Descend and will introduce the main theme of this particular talk, um, text, meet, ghosts. What do I mean by the perpetrated world? I mean the world of text.
Behind this tragic tale of an independent researcher crushed beneath the wheel of entrenched orthodoxical scholarship. Or a naive blunder by a clueless guru who didn't know how he got into it. There's the rest of we descend, the very writings that got him into trouble. As I think about it, I wonder at being chosen by whatever agency to revive these old writings of fellow creatures whom we will never know in any other way. Their reverence has so far failed to be a boon either to their memory or to us, certainly not to me. But the story is not yet over, and I feel it may have only just begun. This thought brings on another. Like the stories they recount of lives long passed away, this gathering of stories itself has a story in which I have played a part, though that part is soon itself to pass away. And of course, each writing in the archives has its own story. And so on. No end of stories and their stories. The story and structure, speaking of stories, uh, what we descend can be sketched in pretty easily. A scholar discovers uh, Agderis, who retrieves the ancients. These three time bands form the heart of We Descend, and almost all of his primary writings are to be found there. In addition, two further time bands can be inferred. The later unknown providence in which the scholar's work has been gathered and arranged so that Bill Bly can later yet render them into hypertext form. <laughs> These time bands can be likened to strata in an archaeological data, which is diagrammed not only in this list, but a little more artfully, if not artistically, in this brown plan. Um, in this schematic of the dig, and by the way, this is an interactive map. You just click on any one of these things, and it opens up the writing that it represents. Um, concentric rectangles show the descending stra strata of time. So the, the darker the, re the rectangle is, and also the smaller, uh, the further or the deeper into the past it is, and the further down it is, that is to say, closer to the center, um, the older the artifact. In this case, a primary writing, um, which is represented by either a green or a blue box, and I'll explain that color coding in a minute. Starting on the west, which is the far side from here, a lighter colored adornment is laid like a lamp down into the hole, and it encloses, encloses scholia or commentary in dark red boxes, each one, and each one of them is placed over top of the time band to which uh, the writing that it refers uh, pertains. This interactive map is part of the orientation pattern that uh, is afforded to the reader of the descent. Now, I have uh, two constraints to enumerate. Uh, first of all, we descend is what we used to call an exploratory, not a constructive <laughs> hypertext. Um, and that is to say, uh, the reader cannot edit the writings, nor annotate them in situ, nor move them around. In other words, it's a read-only document. The other constraint is that this is an artifactual, not a narrative work. There's no single storyteller. There are many, and some of whom comment on and contradict each other, so that the whole story comes to be understood more or less as we experience life, piecemeal and parochially. And this understanding rewrites itself every time the reader encounters a new text or returns to a writing previously visited. Name the article of clothing you are wearing that is not inscribed with text. Name the object in your possession that is not inscribed with text. Even the objects and devices you use to inscribe text upon other objects and devices. Every one of these inscriptions is a transmission from the dwelling place of the ghosts. Every such artifact is the embodiment, the incarnation, the enmeetment 
of a message from the ghosts. What do the ghosts tell us? What do they want us to know, to feel, to experience? What do they want us to do? Feed them. That was the last one again. Kind of a crank, I know. <laughs> and I hope in this next section to account for the thing he has about ghosts. To do that, I need to say a little bit more about artifacts and what I mean by it. An artifact is an object with a story. Now, every object, of course, has a history. When you pick up a pebble on the beach, you know it got there somehow, from somewhere else, through some sequence of events. Given some training, some imagination, some discernment, and if needed, technology, that history can be read. There are no objects. Okay. But that doesn't make it an artifact, at least not in the literary <coughs> sense. The mere pebble on the beach doesn't have a story to tell. It bears no text. Say you're feeling whimsical. So you pick up another pebble and scratch a smiley face on the first one. Now that's an artifact. Every artifact conjures two ghosts. The first is the ghost, of, is the ghost of the person you imagine picking up that pebble and reading its inscription. The other is the ghost imagined by that person when he picks up the pebble and reads its inscription. That is to say, the ghost of you, the sender of the message, have a nice day. Every writing shares this mirrored imagining. In the novel, the single narrator, or for that matter, any piece of expository prose, there are only four characters involved in the transaction. Two real entities, the meat author and the meat reader, and two imagined entities, the meat author imagined by the ghost, I'm sorry, the ghost author imagined by the meat reader, and the ghost reader imagined by the meat author. All of them connected in a complex and mysterious way by what we call text. <coughs> yeah, good. Now, in an artifactual work like We Descend, this imaginated situation is multiply mirrored. You read not only the inscription on every artifact, but also the ghost of the reader imagined by its author. And you do this with multiple writings by multiple authors. It sounds like a whole lot of work. And without doubt, describing it certainly is. But keeping track of these complexities in your mind is child's play. We do it without thinking every time we listen to a story or tell a joke. It's when you want to talk to someone who isn't right there in front of you that the difficulties arise, because then you must resort to text. And text conjures the ghosts who may have other ideas. The story is told that a company traveling through the wilderness was attacked first by robbers who made away with their provisions, and then by wild beasts who ripped to pieces all but one of the members of the party. This person could stay alive only by feeding off what the wild beasts had left behind. When at long last this lone survivor was rescued by another company of travelers, he showed them scraps of dried skin and splintered bone with strange markings on them, saying that they contained the voices of his companions. When asked how this could be, he took up one of the scraps and, gazing at it intently, began to speak in a different voice, telling the story of the person to whom that remainder of flesh or bone had once belonged. Many in the company were revolted by this, and demanded that the poor lunatic be put out of his misery on the spot. But others felt a weird reverence for the man and for the objects he had preserved on his appalling ordeal. They questioned him further, and he taught them how he had captured his lost companions' voices by transferring their utterances from his memory to the inscriptions on the remnants of their presence. And his rescuers, in turn, taught others this magical practice as they continued on their journey. And in this way, 
it spread throughout the world. In doing so, some say, they created a new wilderness, the wilderness of text. Once entered upon, the wilderness of text permits no return. I'm not terribly sure of myself when it comes to theory, uh, theoretics. I feel more comfortable with poems and stories than I do with philosophy and criticism. We just said it's as close as I'm ever going to get to writing a track, for better or worse. 